People look around our world and they see disaster, disease, death. They see problems, pollution, and pain. They scratch their head and say, how did the world get this way? Why are there earthquakes and volcanoes and hurricanes and tornadoes? And why are there wars? And why can't we get along with each other? Why is there cancer? The answer is that someone pulled the plug on our planet's life support system. When Adam chose to rebel against God, he pulled the plug of total dependence upon God. The whole world was opened to sin. Nature was impacted. Earth's ecology changed radically. Disease and death entered in. And from that point on, man would be born with the nature of depravity. See, that's one of the things that we've been speaking of forever. People constantly want to say, why God, why? And maybe if you're having any conversations with somebody with what's going on in Haiti, and you hear someone saying, where was God? Why would God? So on and so forth. Please remind them that in the Bible, very clearly, on a multiplicity of times, it tells us that the ground will shake. That there are these radical things called earthquakes. It is our arrogance and our autonomy to think that we can actually stack cement one on top of another and use rods and that it will hold up. We ignore the teachings of God and hear humanity saying, why God, why? When in reality, God is saying, why humans, why? Why do we continue to think that we can outsmart or ignore the warnings of God? Amen? Amen. It's kind of silent, especially for all of you that live in apartment buildings. It's kind of going, huh, 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 huh. But in reality, God told us that there are going to be hurricanes, tornadoes, so on and so forth. And these are part of a fallen world. Why? Where? Well, tonight we're going to see that. All right. So let's begin to summarize. In Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, if you're a note taker, please note. In Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, we hear God speak. In Genesis 1 and 2, we hear, then God said. Then God said. And whenever we see God speaking, the byproduct of what God had to say in the first two chapters, there was life. Please jot that down. Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is God speaking, and the byproduct is life. Genesis chapter 3, we're now going to hear Satan speaking, and the byproduct of that is going to be death. Okay, so this is the transition that we are going to see is in this byproduct. So, you guys ready? Okay, Genesis chapter 3. Again, lots of notes tonight. Like I said, it's going to be very academic because we're going to give you a lot of background on things where we need to go. All right, chapter 3, verse 1. Now... The serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Let's stop right there. First thing we're going to be looking at tonight, as I said, we have now this contrast of God speaking, let God speak, and then God said, then God said, and now we have this serpent. And the first thing it describes the serpent is what? What's it say? Crafty. Would you note, would you circle, underline it, put somewhere in your notes that that is a description of a personality character, isn't it? Crafty. You see, first thing you need to learn tonight is that Satan is crafty, sneaky. He is, dis, he is um, dishonest. He is clever. He is wise in his ways. Are you following me? Isn't it true that he knows exactly where and how to trip each one of us up in this room? And the way that he trips you is a different way than he's going to trip me up. And so the first thing that we need to learn about our enemy tonight is that he is crafty. Now, secondly, it says now the serpent. Who is this serpent that we're speaking about? Don't bother turning there. Just look overhead if you would. You can jot it down in your Bibles right over the word serpent, right? Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. The Bible makes it very clear for us. It says this, And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called what? Okay, the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world, and he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So if there's any question on who the serpent is, it's clearly Satan. How do I know that? The Bible tells me that. So now we have this Satan coming into the picture, this crafty creature, and he's coming up. And then it says this as we go on in verse 1. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Now, this is the first thing we want to recognize. Please jot this down. This is very, very important, whether you're in your minds or on paper or both. Please hear me clearly. The fall of humanity began with a question. Think about it. The fall of all humanity began with in question. Satan getting us to question the very character of God. He starts off in saying, indeed, indeed, indeed. Did God say that you can't eat anything? God saying that you cannot have any tree. You see, here he comes and he begins to approach him. Now, a couple things to note. First of all, pre-fall, Apparently, animals and humans were able to communicate. See, there is no tripping out with her going, oh, snake's talking. <laughs> Obviously, there was an ability for mankind and animals in this beautiful harmony that there was. So 
so that Kona and I could have had a full-on conversation. How was your day? Fine. How was yours? That's not the case anymore. Now I get, which says, good day, a lot of sleeping, a lot of licking. How was yours? But apparently we have this harmony between the animal kingdom and God's design. Then also I want you to notice is that Satan comes how? Does he come front door? Hi, I'm Lucifer, the deceiver of all kinds. How does he come? He comes in disguise. Please jot that down. He comes in disguise. What did we already learn about him? He's crafty and he loves to come in disguise. Now, one of my favorite movies, not because of its content, not because of its quality, but because its cleverness is so close to truth, is this movie called... Is it Bedazzled? Bedazzled, Elizabeth Hurley. That is the best example of the devil I've ever seen. I'll tell you that right now. Okay? Because the devil, as I've said a million times, does not walk around with this red suit, big tail, horns, and then, come to me. No, that's not the devil. Okay? The devil is going to come clever, crafty, in a way of disguise. And so the first thing we need to recognize is tonight we think, oh, I'm good. As soon as you say, I'm good, as soon as you think you have your guard up, listen, the Bible says when we are weak, he is strong. And so that means when we think we are strong, we are actually weak in the things of Christ because we're not walking in the fear and guard and protection of the armor of God. Amen? Amen. Any one of you tonight that's single that says, I'm saving myself till I get married, I'm telling you right now, you're going down. Because there's going to be a moment when the moon is right. <laughs> the song is flowing. The light is going right up the side of her face. <laughs> the right words are spoken. Rationale has flown out the window. Yeah. And next thing you know it, <laughs> Satan is dead. Tonight if you say, Lord God, leave me alone. I'm in trouble. I don't want to be left alone. Hold me tight. I give you my sexuality because if I hold on to it, I want to do something I shouldn't. Jesus, we need you. That couple is going to remain faithful and true till their wedding night. Amen? recognize, acknowledge our need, recognize that he is clever, he is crafty, he comes in disguise. Listen, any good general needs to know his own army and know his opponent. And that's what we want to do tonight as we look and see these schemes. All right, so indeed, has God said you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? He begins to question tonight. Have you been questioning God? God, where were you? God, how come? God, don't you know I'm 30? Why am I still single? You know my heart. You see, our fall, the fall, begins when we begin to question the character of God. Now notice the thing that starts off with verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, stop, as I said before, we're not going to get very far tonight. Can you just put down, that was her first mistake, conversation, having a conversation with the devil is never a good thing. Okay, because he's really, really good at convincing is there anyone in the room that's going to be honest enough and say amen to me on that one? Amen. You start, well, you know, bit, 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 bit. well, you know, you got a point there. Problem is, we didn't know we were talking to the devil. We thought it was our friend Larry. But the words were just coming through from the dark, and you were just beginning to rationalize, and we all know when we rationalize, it's rational. Okay, so, as we see this conversation going on, and the woman said to the serpent, okay, this crafty guy, she says... From the fruit of the tree of the garden we may eat. Now remember, Satan comes and says, Did God say, really, that you can't have anything? Oh, he wants me to think that I'm giving up. He wants me to think I'm surrendering. He wants me to think I'm the one sacrificing in the Christian walk. And so you're not going to get anything? Really, you're going to live in all these rules? Really, did God say that you can't have sex? Did really God? No, no, God didn't say I can't have sex. He said when and where. Did you really that God said that you can't have pleasure and you can't do what you want? No, no, God says, but he gave me the want to want. In Psalm 37, he's going to give me the want. And so I get all that I want because God gave me the want to want it. <laughs> I need to rewind that for you. No, okay. It says, delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's not the word grant. It means it's the word give. Delight in God and he will give me the desires to desire. So I go to bed at night, a spoiled rotten brat, because I got what I wanted because God gave me the want to want it. Amen? Amen. I don't want to steal. I don't want to go through all these things. I don't want to do these things because as I'm worshiping, when I'm saying how great thou art, my cup overfloweth. And God will change your desires. So he begins to question, look, God is trying to hold you out, hold back on you. So notice what she says. From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, verse 3. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it, now notice, or touch it, lest you die. Now, does anyone have an issue with what was just said? 
Keep your finger right where you are and go to chapter 2, verse 17. See if you can pick up on the problem on chapter 2, verse 17, versus what we have in chapter 3, verse 2. Is there a discrepancy? What is it? Somebody said it. Touch. Notice, in Genesis chapter 2, it says, If you eat from the fruit of the tree, you will die. There is no mention of touch. But here, in chapter 3, when Eve retells the law of God, she says that you shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. Would you please, somewhere in your margins, put, here is the beginning of legalism. This is the beginning of legalism. It's when we add to God's word. When we start saying, well, this is what he really means, or these safeguards, are, this is when we begin to add upon God's word. Remember, God said, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. And then later on, there were 714 laws on how to keep the Sabbath. I mean, including if you spat on the ground, you were making mud, and thus you have broken the Sabbath. I mean, ridiculous things that happen. And you see what happens? Is that when you and I begin to add on and add on and add on to God's word, many of you grew up in a church where you were, you know, don't, don't, don't dance, smoke, drink, chew, or go with girls who do, all these different things, and all the emphasis on what we're not to do so that we can keep a love affair with God, rather than talking about how great and awesome and mighty is our God, and the less I want to do these things. You see, the paradigm is upside down, guys. If you grew up in a mindset that says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and definitely don't do this, and that'll get you closer to God, tonight, learn what it's all about and flip that and learn how much and amazing, how great thou art, God, we have, and the less you'll want to do these things. Love motivated, law motivated. Big difference in whether you go, or, I'll tell you that right now. There's a big difference in your heart tonight. Amen? Amen. All right, now. So we see this legalism by adding to God's words. Unless we can't even touch it, we'll die. And then the serpent said to the woman, verse 4, You surely shall not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, note this. After questioning the word of God, Satan now questions the way of God. See, first he was going after the word. Is this really what God said? And he said, how many of us, when we were young, maybe when we were single, we were trying to find the scriptures. Well, what exactly does the Bible say? How far is too far? Does the Bible say this? Does it say that? What about this? Trying to see how much sin we can get away with. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, the room went quiet on that one. (laughs) You see, trying to search the scriptures, trying to rationalize. You see, what does God do? And so Satan begins to start questioning the word of God, and now he begins to question the way of God. Because God says, if you eat it, what will happen? You'll die. What does Satan say? You're not going to die. Starting to throw in the doubt the question. Now, here's the thing. I want you to pay attention to this tonight. What is the insinuation from Lucifer? We're going to see this throughout this. He is insinuating, hear me, church, because some of you, you are following hard after Jesus all the way up until junior high. And this scene happened in your life didn't even realize you had a conversation with the servant. And you see, the same lie he worked then, he worked into many lives of those who I minister to and counsel with, and that is this. Don't you realize that God is really holding out on you? That's what he's saying. You're not going to die. You see, the thing is, is God's holding out on you. The real fun is out there. He doesn't want you to have fun. Hey, set those things aside and go out and experience joy. Sow your oats. Check out the bars. Live the primo lifestyle. All these different, you know what? Money is the thing that's going to really, you know, when people look at you and all these other things that we're going to look at tonight in a moment. You see, Satan begins to cause you and I, even as the Christians, to begin to think that we are the martyrs. We are the ones that are giving up. We are the ones that are making the sacrifices rather than truly understanding that it was God who made us, God who breathed life into us last week, God is the one who gave me the living being that I might cultivate and enjoy this life. Amen? Amen. Today, this was his gift to us. An amazing blessing of life. And you see, if you're listening to the enemy, you're looking at how much you don't have rather than counting your blessings and naming them one by one. See, tonight, you're either that half empty or, in my theology, totally full. Listen, I'm too blessed to be stressed too anointed to be disappointed. Think about it. We are all doing better than we deserve. Can I get an amen? amen. We're better than we deserve. How are you doing today? Better than I deserve. 
But you see, when you have that attitude, then when anything good happens, parking space, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Someone actually spoke to you on the sidewalk. Hallelujah. <laughs> Miracles are happening every day. <laughs> Getting a chance to go to Jack in the Box. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you for America. <laughs> You see, he begins to question the word of God first and foremost, and then the way of God, and beginning to make us think that we are being held on on. Notice what he insinuates. He insinuates that not only God is holding out, but notice what he promises. Jot this down if you would somewhere. He promises divine enlightenment. That's important because I'm going to bring it up later. He says, you're going to be like God. Now, any Bible student here recognize what was the very first sin ever recorded in history? It's in the Bible. It's in Isaiah chapter 14. Where does it come from? What is the very first sin? Anyone know? Who did it and what was it? It was Lucifer, Satan, and what did he say? I'm going to be like God. He's still trying to get everybody on that plane, isn't he? I'm going to be just like God. And so God says, no, no, you are going down. So he kicks him out of heaven. He's saying the same thing here. He's going, no, no, you're going to be just like God. Gosh, what is Shirley MacLaine out there saying? All you need to do is put your hands out and say, I am God, I am God, I am God. What does this about every commercial say? You are God of your own planet. You are master of your own. Take your credit card and go to that trip. You deserve it. All these different things about our own deity. See, he promises divine enlightenment. You are going to have it. You are going to be fulfilled. This is what he promises. Ironically, notice what he says. Look in the text if you would. Verse 5. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, what does it say? Okay, underline that. Your eyes will be opened. Now that's what Satan says. He says when you disobey God, your eyes will be opened. Now, notice what God says about Satan. Just jot down in your margin, 2 Corinthians 4.4, because 4, in the sake of time tonight, I'm only going to have you turn a couple times. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, look overhead. What does God say about Satan? He says, in whose case the God of this world has what? blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ who is the image of God. How many times have you and I tried to talk and share with somebody and it's just like they're like this. Yeah, but what about, okay, but then what about, well, but that doesn't, because if, that, 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 as we talked about several Sundays ago, not knowing on which side of the cage they're actually on. All they see is the bars and they think we're the ones in bondage rather than the other way around, that that's sin and the strap strangle hold of what others think of them is so important that they spent hours before they even left the house and they've adjusted themselves three times and looked in every window and mirror that they could today to see how they were doing. Rather than just being free to say, hi, it doesn't matter what my hair looks like, what matters is what my heart looks like. And I want to bring the love of Jesus. You see, he promises this illumination. God says, listen, church, listen, I don't know who it is for tonight, whether it's in this audience or whether it's on television, but you are blinded. When you have listened to the lie that God is holding out on you, that there is a better lifestyle, that there is something yet that you still need to discover, this is blinding you and hardening your heart from the true plan of the author who divinely designed this Garden of Eden for us. Now verse 6 says this as we go on. Verse 6 says this, And then when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. Stop right there. Listen, you know this phrase. There's an old phrase, and it goes like this. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Don't fix it. I'm going to let you in on a little secret tonight. You ready for this? Satan has not had to change his plan of seduction in who knows how many thousands of years from the Garden of Eden today. You know why? Because if it ain't broke... Don't fix it. It's still working. Let me show you what I mean. Keep your fingers, if you would, right here and go to 1 John, almost to the end of the New Testament. Go to 1 John, if you would, chapter 1, verse 25. The very same plan that worked in the Garden of Eden, he is using every day on you and I today in 2010. We will see this in 1 John, chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Remember, we're talking about this agape. Do not agape this cosmos, the secular system, the things that are around us in the Greek. It's saying, that's not where my total heart is supposed to be. Can I love surfing? Sure. But I'm not to agape surfing. Am I to love even my wife? 
Yes, and I am to agape my wife, but not in the way that I am to agape unconditionally, first and foremost, God. And so he says, don't love these things of this world. Verse 16, for all that is in the world. Now notice, get your pencils ready if you haven't. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from what? It's from the world. Now, get your pencils ready because I want you to write down three words to help you understand this. This is how I use this all the time. The first one is the word passions. Okay? The lust of the flesh. And so passions. The way in which Satan works is he comes after our passions. Okay? Whether they be sexual, whether they be food, whether they be in materialism, whatever they would be in creature comforts, he goes after our passions. And so the very first things, he says, hey, be careful. Do not love the lust of the flesh. And then he goes on to say the next one, and that is possessions. Possessions, that's the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. These are the things that we see and, ooh, we want them. You ever notice you're having a great day until you happen to walk by a store in the mall and all of a sudden you look in and you see all the things that now you want that you didn't know 10 minutes ago that you wanted and now you're always upset about your job because your job doesn't pay you enough because if they did, you could have bought those things that you wanted that you didn't know you wanted until 10 minutes ago? Amen? Amen. Or am I the only monkey that does that? You walk by and, oh, look at that stand-up board. Oh, look at this. Oh, man. Oh, man, if I wasn't having to pay enough the house or whatever, I could sure da 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 And all of a sudden, you start getting in all these different things. The eyes start seeing and the eyes start wanting. And as we've already talked about several times tonight, let's put this back in the context of relationships as well as on last week we spent all the time on relationships. The lust of the eyes. Listen, church. It's important that we understand the difference between admire and desire. It's okay to admire. And the way that I describe it is the sunset mentality. When you look at a sunset, like last night's, absolutely amazing. When you look at that, you admired it, didn't you? You just went, wow, beautiful sunset. Nobody said, boy, would I like to jump into that sun. (laughs) There was no desire for the sun. There was the admire for the sun. When you see someone beautiful, you can go, wow, beautiful person. Husband and wife, you can say that without punching each other. Okay? Admire. Okay? That is not the lust of the eyes. When it turns to desire, then it becomes the lust of the eyes. And then the last one, we got passions, we got possessions. And then this last one, position. Oh, how many I have seen the enemy taking them in position. And that is the boastful pride of life, as it says in 1 John. Position. You know how many marriages that I know that have been destroyed because people were serving after their careers because they wanted a certain dot, dot, dot on the bottom of their business card? And so they sacrificed everything and everyone, including kids and family, in order that they might have the position, that they might climb this corporate ladder. Maybe for some here tonight, the whole position thing of what others think of you, and so the sacrifices that have been made because you want to have some kind of entitlement or title in this earth, claim, trying to prove to someone who said earlier in your life that you had no worth, and so you're trying to say, no, 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 my positions, my passions, my possessions, these are the things that are going to show my value. Oh, Satan has so many people grabbed. I don't know how many times I've seen people, hey, pastor, would you pray for me? I need a job. Great. We prayed for them. And all of a sudden they come running up and say, I got a job. I got a job. Praise the Lord. I'm like, great. When do you work? Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. I'm like, you think that came from God? (laughs) Satan gives jobs too. Amen. Amen. The Lord is not going to bring that which is contrary to his word, which says, hey, Take time, be still, know that I'm God, honor and keep the Sabbath. We just looked at that last week. So I really call into question you who think that was God when God says these are the very things that I want you to do. Are we settling for the first thing or are we waiting for God's best? Are we going to go after the Ishmael with Hagar or are we going to wait for the Isaac from Sarah? God's promise for his people. And so Satan knows he can just throw out at us passions, possessions, positions, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. He has not changed his tune, but I want to show you one time when it didn't work. Would you now go with me to Matthew chapter 4? It says this, And the tempter, this Satan, this serpent, And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now why does he say that to Jesus? Because Jesus has been fasting for how long? 40 days. And that's why I love just the chapter above it says, And he was fasting for 40 days and he was hungry. That's the biggest no duh. Okay, it says it right there. And he was fasting for 40 days and nights, verse 2, and then became hungry. Uh Uh-huh. And so a very practical need. And so what happens here? The enemy comes up to my Jesus and says, hey, listen, buddy, 
lust of the flesh. Take care of your passions. This is what you need to do. You need to turn these rocks into bread. Now, is turning rocks into bread a sin? No, I wish I could do it. Okay, would it even be necessarily a sin for Jesus? No, it wouldn't have been a sin for Jesus except for the fact that Jesus was fasting. He was fasting. Okay? He's fasting. He is on a spiritual pilgrimage for what God is calling him to do. And so Satan comes up and prays upon his need and says, Hey, hey, Jesus, turn that stone to bread. Look, it's round, it's bright, it looks like bread. You know you want it. <laughs> but he answered, verse 4, It is is written. If that's not highlighted or underlined in your Bible, I would suggest it become so. How does he answer? It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. Then the devil took him to the holy city and stood him on the pinnacle of the temple and he said to him, if you are the son of God, what is that? He's challenging his position. If you are the son of God, then throw yourself down. Show me your stuff, big guy. If it's you, because notice, who's quoting scripture here? The devil. Would you underline that? Would you note that? Put that somewhere. Just because someone's quoting scripture doesn't mean they're from Jesus. Okay, there's a lot of guys in funny suits with nice watches that are saying a lot of things that ain't from Jesus. Just because they're quoting scripture. Is it from the context and the content that is in the way that God intended it to be heard? And so Satan begins to twist scripture as he does even tonight. He will give you his angels in charge concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. But notice, he is challenging Satan, or Jesus, on his position. Hey, show your stuff. Be the big guy you are. Let's go for it. I will, I will just be so stoked. But Jesus, verse 7, said to him, On the other hand, meaning you show me scripture, but let me put it in context. It is written, you shall not. What's it say, church? Do not tempt the Lord your God. Do not tempt the Lord your God. Oh, as I said before, I wish I had time because I have 50 different sermons where I can go tonight in this. But do not tempt the Lord thy God, meaning let's not put ourselves in the position of the environment that maybe, just maybe, we will fall. Listen, AA has a great saying, and that is this. You hang out in a barbershop long enough, you're going to get a haircut. Mine is easier than that. If you're in a diet, don't go in the candy store. Doesn't that make sense? If you're in the diet, don't go in the candy store. Don't be walking into Baskin Robbins. Come on, that ain't wisdom. Oh, I just want to read the wall. <laughs> well, it's those tiny pink spoons. I'm just going to take a tiny pink spoon. A pink spoon. Peanut butter touch, please. It's a sampling. That's all I'm doing. Okay, normally I get three. I'm just getting one. I'm just going to get the one. Rationalize, it's rational. And so here, Jesus is saying, no, 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 it's written. Don't tempt the Lord your God. Don't try to put him to the test. The test is for me. Waxer, will you walk by in faith knowing that I have better than Baskin Robbins? Wow, that's faith. <laughs> Verse 8. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you. All you need to do if you fall down and worship me, lust of the eyes, possession. You know what, Jesus? That whole cross thing, don't need to do it. I'll give it to you right now. He's questioning God's word. He's questioning God's way. And Jesus responds all three times with, it is what? Amen. The word of God. You see, Satan comes to us calling us to question God's word. Jesus shows me to respond using God's word. Amen. That's where we come, folks, and we've got to learn it. We've got to know it to call upon it. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I sin not against thee, David said. So with that in mind, now let's go back to Genesis and look at our sister Eve here. Notice at the moment she's still called the woman. And so notice what it says here in the scriptures. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, passions, and that it was a delight to the eyes, possessions, lust of the eyes, and that it was desirable to make one wise position. Oh, she fell for the three in one scoop. Boom. And there she went. And so it says, what does it say the scriptures did? She took from the fruit and she ate. Now, let's continue on in that verse. And it says this. And she gave also to her husband with her. 
and he ate. Now, folks, this teeny little section of this verse has been the subject of more question, more debate, confusion, baffling scholars, how, just what, when, where, and why this all took place. Because as this conversation is going on with the woman, the first question we're all asking is, where's Adam? Okay, well, apparently by this time, Adam is here. So maybe not in the beginning of the conversation, but when it comes to this point, Adam is now here. And so it says, first of all, that she took from it and she ate. And then it says, and she gave also to her husband. And what did he do? He ate. Okay, important. You see that? that you underline that. Now, let me give you a couple of views on what some scholars think. I'm going to give you two different views, and you can tonight pray about it, see whichever direction that you think that was going on here. The first one is the emphasis that talks about how Eve was deceived. And we see that in the scriptures if you look overhead. It says in 1 Timothy 2.14, it says, And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman, being quite deceived, fell into transgression. You see, the first theory is this, that it was Eve who was deceived by the passions, possessions, positions. And so she was deceived by this crafty disguise. But Adam, Adam did full-on out rebellion. Now think about that. People read that verse and they think it's bashing the women. No, it's not. It's saying, listen, she was deceived, but Adam the monkey, he straight on and did it. In rebellion. You see, you've got to know and know that as soon as Eve ate of it, the glory that was upon her, the sinlessness nature about her, disappeared and there was some manifest change. It's got to be because we see that through the rest of the scriptures and what happens when they get removed. And so here is Adam coming alongside. And here's the first thing that we see begin to take. We see questioning God. We see the very first sin here on earth. We see now the headship, the guiding, the protector, the governor not doing his job. He passively steps to the side and allows his bride to do something that God warned and said, don't go there. Last week he was going, whoa, man. Woman, wow. Bone in my bone, flesh in my flesh. Oh, Lord, I'll do whatever it takes. And you see, what some people think is that when Eve took and partook, Adam, listen to me, he ate in rebellion. He ate out of fear. Fear that, oh my gosh, here she is. She's going to be removed from me. Uh, I don't want her to be removed because she means so much to me. So whatever the cost, I want her. And so in absolute rebellion, he partook out of fear that he would no longer be with her and says, I would rather take the judgment, whatever it is, because I want her so badly. Was there a transference of his God? First it was Elohim, now it's the woman. That's a theory, that's a thought, that's a possibility. But others have a more compassionate view of what Adam actually did. And they believe it leans more towards this. Look overhead, if you would, at Romans chapter 5, verse 14. Or if you can turn there real quick, it would be interesting for you to see this, because I have two verses for us to see in Romans 5. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam. Notice, of Adam, who is a type of him who is to come. Notice, who is a type of him who was to come. Now, let me have your attention for a second. There are some scholars who suggest that what happened is in this theory here, where Paul is talking about this, who is the type of him to come, could just reference humanity, and Jesus then became human, and so Jesus took that nature. We talked about the first Adam and the last Adam, but some scholars go so far to suggest that perhaps, just perhaps, that when Adam saw his wife, saw his woman, his love partake, and the glory came upon him, that rather than out of fear, he chose in faith to rather be joined with her so that God would do the work together for them. In other words, I wasn't there when I should have been, but I'm going to be there with you now. He recognized his need. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says, he who knew no sin, what? Became sin. He there went to the cross and took the iniquity upon him. Is this what he's referencing? That it was a type of, in other words, Adam chose to be with. And God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He chose to be with us, a fallen and sinful people, that he might redeem us. Amen? Now, exactly which one it is, I don't know. <laughs> I see elements in both. The point of the matter is, as gentlemen in this room, he wouldn't have had to do this if he'd done his duty in the first place. Amen? You see, 
verse 19 is the byproduct. Regardless of whatever his direction and his, his reasons for doing it, this willful action, because of it, humankind has had a sin problem. It says in 519, for as though, excuse me, for as through the one man, talking about Adam, disobedience, the many were made sinners. You and I, we've all received the sin nature. We talked about that last week. I don't have the time. Even so, through the obedience of the one, notice that underline, that it's not just one, but it's the one. So through one man, sin, Adam, disobedience, now through the obedience of the one, the many are made righteous. And so here we have Jesus paying the price. Adam brought it in, but Jesus paid the price and sets it out. Amen? Okay, you still with me? All right, cool. Right on. Verse 7, back to the text. Back to the text. So now we see the first failure here in what God has designed in the family unit and the covenant. We see the first failure as we begin to question God, as we begin to have passions, possessions, positions. We see all these elements where the enemy is still attacking and plaguing us today. And we say, where did this come from? Why is there domestic violence? Why is there so much fighting and bickering in the home? Why are there so many divorces? Because we don't get what he said in chapter 2, and we see the problem in chapter 3. Verse 7, it says this. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. Okay, now, Satan says, hey, you'll be opened. Yeah. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew what? That they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Well, gee, so much for divine illusion, illuminant, okay? We thought here, all of a sudden, we would be illuminated if we partake. We're going to be like God. Instead, what happened? What was the byproduct of once they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? What were they? Were they divinely illumined? Were they just like God? No, they were insecure. Pay attention to that. Jot that down somewhere. Meditate upon that. You see, when you and I step out out of God's word, will, and we find ourselves very insecure. Tonight, I do not have a confidence that is a self-confidence. I don't like that phrase, self-confidence. I've had people even say to me before when I'm talking to them, you're very confident, are you? Well, I said, I'm very sure. I'm very sure that what I'm sharing with you is true because I'm very sure about a very living God because he's very real to me. Tonight, please do not call me cocky. Rather, please say, what is it about this guy that has this assurance, this confidence? And it's not self-confidence, it's God confidence. Amen. And that's what it is. Because God has shown me over and over and over. We talked about that on Sunday, prophecy. You know, all these things that are revealed, His Word can't be trusted and that it's true. And so here we have God coming and saying, listen, here's the deal. Here's the plan. This is what I want for you to do. And when we begin to step out, when we step into sin, when we walk in our own way, the byproduct is insecurity. Listen, I have told this to you many times before. For 22 years working with youth, youth pastor in whatever context, you can put me in a room of two to 500 teenagers and give me a half hour to look around and watch. And I will point and I will tell you, broken home, lives with mom, lives with dad, blended family, blah, blah, blah. And I can go around and point and you're like, oh, he's a prophet. <laughs> no. I can watch and see the constant adjustment, the looking down, the things that go on, the movements, the needs, the way in which the dress, the way in which the mannerisms, the way in which the handshake comes. I can read all of that. This insecurity is the byproduct of a home that has not been walking in fulfillment of God's plan. Insecurity. What has racked so many of you here tonight, what has caused you to fall prey to so many temptations, fall prey to so many suggestions of things that you know in your heart were wrong, but because of the care of what others were thinking, you see this insecurity. This is a lie from the pit of hell. You see, here's the thing. We recognize that they were not given illumination. In fact, when we get cocky and when we think we don't need to hear from God anymore, when we think we can just go on our own and we can eat from the tree of knowledge, and listen, I don't need this. I don't need to look at God's word anymore. I can just do my own thing. I can guarantee you the byproduct of that is going to be insecurity. You know how I know that? Why does BMW need to keep making every single six months a new model? So that you need a new model because your old model, you're going, oh, you're driving the half, you know, the 209. <laughs> Business must not be good. I got the 211. It's not even 211 yet. I know. <laughs> That's how important I am. Listen, if it's still running, drive them. Am I making a sense? Making a point? You see this insecurity thing. We don't need to run after this. You see, let's quit going after the tree of knowledge and let's do what the Lord says. It says their eyes were open and they knew they were naked and all of a sudden they recognized their need. They recognized their insecurity. And so what did they do, church? What's it say in the rest of verse 7? 
They sewed what? Fig leaves. fig leaves together. Now, you guys have been with me long enough. We know we've talked about this in Leviticus. What are fig leaves? Itchy. itchy. They're scratchy, itchy. Now, where did they cover themselves? Oh, way. <laughs> if there's one place I don't want to be itchy, it's there. <laughs> You see, church, this is what happens when we try to cover up our own insecurities and sin. Amen? Amen. You know tonight, if I was to give you a list right now, list five things that are just not right in your life, and that are like, this could go perfect. If I say, give me five things that are just going awesome, things that you love about yourself. I do that all the time. People are like, five things you want to change about your body. (laughs) Five things that are great about your body. Would you start with, it's working. (laughs) I'm here breathing. (laughs) Okay. Let's look at these things. And you see, understanding where are we looking at? What is the mindset? What is the standard that we're setting things up from God's world or or, or from God's worldview or from the world's worldview? And you see, they sewed fig leaves together. And it's just, oh my gosh. And so when you and I try to fix it, rationalize it, question it, whatever, it just makes things worse worse. Tonight, are you doing this? Because <laughs> every single week God says, you know what, just lay it down. And you're like, I will, but next week, Lord. Just stop this relationship. I know, God. I will. I promise I will. I will. <laughs> but he's going to get saved one of these days, Lord. Or just trying to cover up going into the tree of knowledge, trying to rationalize, rather than just trusting and obeying. Now, verse 8, this is what happens. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, what's it say they did? They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. Can you imagine a sadder commentary? What is it that humanity longs for and craves for the most? It's right here. It's being able to walk with God in the cool of the day. You may not even know it tonight, but that is your greatest need. Not another car, not an affirmation, not your dad saying, I am proud of you or love you. No, no, no. All these things that have come upon that seem to rise up as the insecurities, the reasons why the enemy has plagued us, got us into drugs, got us... No, 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 no. What you and I need, first and foremost in everything, (coughs) is to be able to walk with God. It says, Enoch walked with God. And then it says, and he was not. You know what that means? The Bible says that means he was taken directly up to heaven. You know what I love about that? That means Enoch must have walked so far with God, one day God said, you know what? Enoch, you're closer to my house than yours. Why don't you just come home with me? Amen. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool that if, you know, a Larson had to come up and say, um, Pastor Waxer won't be here tonight, and uh, it's because we don't know where he is. He just went for a walk with God and disappeared. <laughs> that booger. Got the glory. Tonight, are you hiding yourself from God? See, here's God, their maker, the one who walked in the garden with Adam and helped Adam see his need and brought the love of his life where he went, whoa, man, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, my equal. The creator of everything. It says, come on, just all the fellowship. The God of the universe, the God who when we have a chance just to worship in those few moments when it lines up that my planet and the kingdom of heaven and I can just see the glory of God and you're just in your car and you're crying and someone looks at you and goes, what's wrong with you? You're just worshiping and celebrating God. That intimacy, the thing that God, and here is God coming, listen, God coming unto them. They're not looking for God, God is looking for them. And what are they doing? They're hiding. Oh my gosh, tonight are you hiding from God because you've listened to a lie that your sin has made you unworthy? That you are not capable, you are not able. You once were serving God and then you stepped aside and listened to the passions, possessions, positions, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, and now you feel sidelined. That is a lie from the pit of hell. God wants to restore you tonight. He wants to heal you. He wants to bring harmony back and let you chill with Him in the cool of the day. Amen? That's the Bible. That's the gospel. That's what we're going to see in a little bit of the moment. The question is tonight, are you hiding? You don't need to be hiding. When I, at the end of the service, say, hey, do you want to give your life to Jesus? Stand up. Go ahead and go. It's like, yeah, I am not going to hide. I want what God is offering. 
fellowship, harmony, knowing who I am and why I'm here, having vision, value, and purpose, having a harmony in my heart and in my soul because I know why I'm loved and why I'm here. If you don't know that tonight, I'm telling you, you ain't Christian. Because that's what God promises His children. You ought to be able, brothers and sisters in the Lord, when someone says, who are you and why are you? I'm a child of God, fearfully and wonderfully made. We are His workmanship, created for good things in Christ. I'm ready to rock for Jesus. <laughs> that's what we are to be about. Serving, blessing, worshiping, not hiding. Please don't come and leave early. Don't hide. Think that you don't have anything. When we say small groups, don't think, well, what would anyone want to have to do with me? I don't have anything to give. I don't have any insights. I didn't... St- no. He wants you front and center with the rest of his kids. Amen? Amen. See, they were hiding. God initiated this relationship, guys, and we'll see he paid the ultimate price to keep it. Now notice, verse 9, a very powerful verse. Verse 8, he comes looking. They start hiding. Verse 9, Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Now, can we pause right there for a second? Would you please not be one of those silly people who come up to me and ask, Well, look right here. If God knows all things, why did he have to ask the question? (laughs) Gosh, go back to junior high. Okay? This question, very clearly from the text, jot this down, is a positional question, not a logistical question. God knows exactly where they are. Then why is the Lord asking this question? Notice, God did not ask, where have you been? God not even asked, what did you do? What did God say? He said, where are you? And dear ones, if you would allow me tonight, that's the most important question being asked this evening. Where are you? Where are you in your walk with God? Are you in the garden? Did you spend time today in harmony and fellowship and being made to be more like Him? Delighting in Him? Or are you hiding? Hiding behind busyness. And when we are too busy, help me out church, T-O-O-B-U-S-Y, we are totally over-occupied being under Satan's yoke. That's a form of hiding. You see, where are you tonight? Fearfully and wonderfully made. Hallelujah. Where are you tonight? right under his spout where his blessing comes out because I just want all that he has for me. Nothing more, nothing less. Where are we tonight? You see, God came to Adam and he says, where are you? Why? Very clearly. Because God isn't trying to squeeze any information out of him. He doesn't want information from Adam. He wants confession. Tonight, God doesn't need any information. You don't have to come up and lay out all... No, no, no. God wants confession from us. That is the first step. If we confess our sin... He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's what God is saying. Where are you tonight? When we worship tonight, the question is going to be, where are you? Lord, I'm right here. Scabs, bruises, and bumps, but I'm here. And he says, great, let me heal you. Let me cleanse you. Let me use you so that even your scars will be used for my glory. Amen. We go through what we go through to help others get through what we've gone through. Listen, God asks, where are you? Not because He wants to embarrass Him or that He needs information about His sin. God asks Him, where are you? Because, listen, church, when we confess our sin, it loses its grip on us. Some of you tonight are still struggling with porn and it's on your computer. Listen, tell a brother, tell somebody, confess that sin. God is saying, where are you? You say, you know what? I am a guy who wants to serve Jesus, but this thing's got a stronghold on me and someone needs to come kick my computer. First kick me, then kick my computer. (laughs) And listen, Brian Caldwell will be there the next day and we'll put on software that will protect you from you. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. And as a family of God and a brotherhood, we will watch over one another and stir one another on towards love and good deeds. Amen? You see, confession, folks, confession, the reason why God comes up with confession, listen, confession doesn't bring forgiveness. Forgiveness was already given at Calvary. Confession doesn't bring the forgiveness. No, no, no. It was granted at the cross. That's what it says in 1 John. Confession, it comes to me that I can have it break its bond upon me. Confession is critical in my life. And so God is going to ask you tonight, as he asks me every single day, well, actually, where are you? And I can't answer. Well, yesterday we were... No. This moment, this day, brother, where are you? Is your heart right? Do you have pilakia with somebody? Is there something that needs to be surrendered? to the Lord. 
And it says here in verse 10, and he said, notice, this is his response. I heard the sound of thee in the garden. And I was, what does it say? Would you please just underline that and say I was afraid. The contrast from you will be like God. You will have divine illumination. No, no, no. They were insecure. Because of the sin, nothing that Satan promised came true. I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? Notice, God once again is giving Adam room to come clean. Room to pour out his heart before God. Does he? Does he? What does verse 12 say? And the man said, the woman who thou gavest to me. She gave from me of the tree, and I ate. Oh, my goodness. God gives a second, third, fourth, 50 chances, doesn't he? So where are you today? Well, you know, it's this thing. And when this thing gets, then I'm all yours, Lord. How are we doing on the tithing? Well, right now I'm paying off student loans. And when I get that taken care of, Lord, you know, I'll be right there. Oh, but then, oh, we got kids. Oh, well, you know, those school fees right now, you know, in college. And then, well, you know what, our retirement fund right now, Lord. Whatever it would be, whatever God has called us to do in walking in our lives of obedience. You see, right here, as I told you tonight, we're going to learn the beginning of all critical things in our lives. Here begins the blame game, doesn't it? And what I want you to see is who, in fact, does Adam blame first? Most of you giggled and said, the woman, Uh uh-uh. Who does he blame first? He blames God. It's the chick you gave. Hello. If you didn't give her to me, if you didn't answer my prayer, then I wouldn't be in this trouble. It's all your fault, God. Oh, we may want to chuckle tonight, but wouldn't it be embarrassing if we had to go around the room and truly be transparent on how many times we've actually blamed God? If you didn't this, then I wouldn't that. God, why did you take my grandmother? I'm still angry with you. Well, God, how come this? Or where was this, God? We begin to question because of Lucifer's trial, his his schemes and his craftiness and his disguises. We begin to question the character of God. We begin to question the word of God and the way of God and the will of God. Rather than saying, righteous and true are your judgments, O God. As Job said, though you slay me, I will praise you. Are we those kinds of Christians tonight? Or we say, comfort, O comfort. That's my favorite verse. (laughs) Comfort me, Jesus, with a comfortable pillow. (laughs) With down sheets, because it's cold. Even though it's 64 in Hawaii and that's freezing. (laughs) So what happened? Who told you we're naked? Did you eat from the tree? Uh, the woman by the way which you gave mm, she gave it to me oh yeah and then I ate now I love this so now the Lord says to the woman what is this that you have done and the woman said following the lead from her husband the blame game The serpent deceived me, and I ate. It wasn't me. It was that slimy little snake. And he said, eat. It's good. I'll make you wise. Go get him, God. Get him. You know what I love? I love that God just plays along. Did you do this, Adam? No, it wasn't me. It was her. Did you do this? No, it wasn't me. It was a snake. Oh, oh, God's just playing along. I wonder how many of you tonight, you think you're really fooling somebody because God's just playing along when really God is still waiting for you to fess up. And God's just waiting for you to say, I'm an addict. That's what I am. And I need your help, oh God. I am weak in this area, and Lord God. That I am no longer going to blame this and that. And who didn't tell me they loved me when I was a child? And I'm going to stop looking at all the symptoms and I'm just going to admit the core, the cause, the problem as I ain't walking with you in the cool of the day. Because I've yet to hear, I've yet to believe, 
and recognize that I am fearfully and wonderfully made, forgiven and chosen and loved by the God of the universe. See, one is churchianity, the other is legalism, and the other is Christianity. Are you tonight walking because he just loves you just because? You're not worthy, I'm not worthy, but we come because he loves us. Amen? Amen. Legalism says, oh, you got to do this and you got to do that. Rationalism says, you don't need anybody or anything. Just eat from the tree of knowledge. But Jesus says, I know who you are. I know what you're about. And I love you even more. It's not clean up your act and come follow me. It's follow me and watch what we'll do with your act. And we'll transform you. So now, the blame game goes on and God just plays along. And now verse 14. I think this is where I'm going to try to wrap it up for us tonight because we're not going to get through. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this thing, because you have done this thing, cursed are you all the more than all the cattle and all the more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And he will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Oh, church, hear me this. The outcome, listen, the outcome of the fall was that women and snakes become enemies. Interesting. He says, this friendship, it ain't going to happen anymore. Now most of the time it's, oh, snakes. Women and snakes become enemies. Listen, likewise, people who base their relationships on sin ultimately end up being enemies. And not wanting anything to do with each other. Think about it. Whether it's businesses, whether it's even family, whether it's relationships that God did not intend. And day in and day out, I hear people going, oh, this person, and, and all these heartaches and hurts and breakups because the relationship was founded in and progressed in sin. And for that reason, the byproduct of sin is nakedness. It's not fulfillment. It's heartache. 